So hello and welcome everybody. Um, we are going to wait a few more minutes as people start logging on and um, then we'll get started. So just sit tight and um, I will, um, we'll get started in a minute or two. So, okay, I think we have a good um, number of people who have logged on right now, so I guess we can get started. Uh, hello and welcome. My name is Kim Landgraf and I'm the liaison for the Women in Security Forum. So glad you could join us for this first in a series on human trafficking presented by the SIA Women in Security Forum, the Women in International Security, and Saved in America. Today's webinar will focus on misconceptions about human trafficking and ways to recognize and respond to it. We're going to kick it over to Don Erickson, CEO of the Security Industry Association and a forum committee member. He will provide some intro remarks about SIA. Kim, thanks very much. And I'd like to welcome everybody to today's broadcast and in particular, thank all of our panelists. For those of you who are not familiar with SIA, SIA is an international trade association that represents the most innovative security technology companies in the world. And through our education, our advocacy, our standards development, and our research, we work with our companies and more importantly, their employees to keep people and property safe. And I want to give a special shout out to MIN and the Women in International Security Organization for working with SIA both, most, most recently on our wellness series and, and today's program as well. So MIN, thank you very much. And also would like to thank our very own Kim Langraf, who does an outstanding job. We have an awesome association staff and Kim is a very, very key part of that. And so Kim, thanks for all your efforts as well. With that said, it's it's my pleasure now to welcome our partner in today's broadcast, Martine Warda from Women in International Security, New York chapter. Martine, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Don, and welcome everybody. <clears throat> so my name is Martine Warda. As he mentioned, I'm head of events at WISE New York. The New York chapter of Women in International Security uh, is to advance and promote the leadership and professional development of women in the field of security and safety. We sponsor events and networking programs focused on security and related subjects uh, and create a diverse community of security conscious individual by raising awareness of relevant global and local issues. Issues from technology, counterterrorism, conflict prevention, uh, but also human rights and in this case human trafficking. Um, we, we'd like to thank, uh, particularly Saved in America, for participating in this forum. Saved in America is a nonprofit organization of volunteers who assist parents and law enforcement in locating missing and runaway children. Um, I'm very happy to have this um, webinar on this topic. It's so important for parents to be cognizant of the danger, but also the support that's available. So to kick things off, I'd like to welcome the panelists. We welcome Maureen Toll. She's part of the advisory board of Saved in America and mother of a recovered child. She will share her story. Adam Luxalt, who served as Nevada's 33rd attorney general, where one of his top priority was pursuing justice for victims of sexual assault. Stephanie Myers uh, is also on the advisory board of Saved in America, IT strategist, political advisor, working with the current administration. She's also co-host uh, in uh, Your Voice America. She's appeared on a number of shows such as uh, um, Fox News, um, and, uh, MSNBC, CNN, The Today Show, MTV, The Apprentice, and a variety of radio shows speaking on child sex trafficking. Uh, we'll also be hearing at the end of the, towards the end of the, of the webinar, we'll also be hearing a video of Senator Brian Jones, who serves the people of California uh, in the 38th Senate District. Now, representing WISE New York, as already been introduced, Min Kirianis, co-president, she will be moderating, moderating the conversation and providing respective perspectives from the industry. Welcome all, such a pleasure to have you. And now I'll hand it over to Min. Great, thank you. Hello, um, this is my name is Min Kirianis, and thank you everyone for attending this webinar. Um, I am the co-president of WISE New York, and again, my sincerest thanks 
to everyone, to Don, to Martine, and also to Save the America for actually partnering with us to bring just awareness to such a critical topic, because I myself had actually encountered something similar. But before we get started with the discussion, actually, we're going to start off with Senator Brian Jones, our California Senator Brian Jones, who was unable to join us. So, Kim, if you don't mind, if we can share the video with everybody. Hello, I'm Senator Brian Jones, and I have the great honor of serving you in the California State Senate. And first off, I want to thank Saved in America, Women in International Security, and the Security Industry Association for inviting me to participate today. All of you are heroes and are doing great things to help keep people safe and to help rescue people from heartbreaking crime of human trafficking. I also want to applaud all the good work being done by my fellow panelists, Stephanie Brown, Maureen Toll, and former Attorney General Adam Laxalt. Thank you. As we all know, everything today is magnified by the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. This unfortunately also includes human trafficking activity. As Secretary of State Pompeo stated last month in the annual U.S. State Department Traffic in Persons Report, Instability and lack of access to critical services caused by the pandemic mean that the number of people vulnerable to exploitation by traffickers is rapidly growing. Increasing labor exploitation in Asia, the Middle East, and South America is drastically increasing and is extremely disheartening. The COVID pandemic and all of its effects worldwide are unfortunately creating more trafficking opportunities for entities in countries such as China, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nicaragua. We must continue to keep up international pressure on these countries to stop looking the other way and instead crack down on human traffickers operating within their borders. We also know that unfortunately human trafficking is not limited to foreign lands and we still have major challenges here in the United States and right here in our San Diego region. There was a very interesting discussion last month on KPBS about how the number of reported cases of online child exploitation has tripled in San Diego County since the COVID pandemic began. Kids are home from school all the time now. They are online and social media a lot more now and are even more susceptible to online predators that lurk out there. These predators These prey on the innocence and vulnerability of children, of children, often children, luring children, children into children sending children photos or videos, photos of, themselves. videos of themselves. Summer Stephan, the San Diego DA, and, and Bill Gore, the San Diego Sheriff, have set up a task set force to specifically go after these creeps that target your and my kids. I know many of you are working with the DA and Sheriff, and again, I applaud you for your efforts. I'm not telling you anything new, one of the best preventions of child exploitation is getting parents involved and aware of what's going on early in the process. Let's every one of us commit today to step up our efforts to inform our neighbors, friends, and family members with kids that they need to become more involved with protecting and educating their kids about staying safe. The issue of human trafficking knows no boundaries and is one of the examples of an issue that truly receives bipartisan attention in the California legislature. In the legislature, we will be concluding our two-year legislative session at the end of August, but we have already enacted many measures aimed at human trafficking, increased funding, strengthening local ordinances, better compensation for victims, and more background checks of drivers are but a few of the legislative successes that we've had over the last couple of years. However, we can do more, we all need to do more, and we all will do more. We have no choice, too many human lives are still too vulnerable. Thank you for all the great work that you're doing, I appreciate all that you do, and commit to you my service in helping eradicate child trafficking from our country. Thank you, Mar thank you, Kim. And again, thank you, Senator Jones, for taking time out of your busy schedule to actually make this recording for our audience and dedicating your time to such an important cause. Uh, this topic is 
at the forefront for us at, in Wise New York that we actually have dedicated in building a task force to engage our community and mostly to support the efforts around ending this crisis. <clears throat> we will be learning from our panels the current legislative efforts, how technology has changed the landscape on trafficking and what this looks and feels like from the victim's perspective. And also, most importantly, how we as security professionals can raise awareness and protect our community and families. So we're going to be doing a roundtable discussion around this specific topic at hand. So if the attendees and audience have any questions or comments that they'd like the panel to ask or answer, please leave it at the chat session. Um, we will get to them. We will have someone moderating the chat's channel. But before we begin, um, we do want a little audience participation. So the question that we're going to put on, Kim, if you don't mind, are you aware that human trafficking is occurring in your neighborhood? Um, I don't know if the poll can come up, Kim. Thank you. If folks don't mind answering that, and you know, in, in that instance, we're going to start prepping Maureen's hall. Um, I think based on Martine's introduction of you, your parent um, and you yourself has a very heartbreaking experience. Luckily, um, you know, a survivor as well. So we would love to hear a little bit about that um, after we have a call. And it seems close to 50-50, which is a little scary. Maureen, I'm going to turn to you. Can you give a little story about what happened with you and your child, <laughs> please? Thank you for the opportunity to tell my story. In January 2016, my 16-year-old daughter took off uh, from my home to uh, go to a friend's house down an isolated road. She never showed up there. Uh, we started frantically calling friends, everybody she knew. We looked along the route, we couldn't find her. After a time, we called the police and a missing uh, persons report was filed on her and our nightmare began as parents of a missing child. Um, our, our local police department, we realized very quickly, was going to be of limited help. Uh, they squandered, you know, opportunities to find her. Uh, they assigned a school resource officer who could not leave the city. And uh, so we quickly realized that we were on our own. And um, later, this is a couple weeks after she was missing, we got a lead that she may be with a 15-year-old girl that had disappeared two months before from a, a treatment center for human trafficking in uh, the Van Nuys area, in San Fernando Valley. And so we contacted the mother and she had used a private investigator previously to try to track down her 15-year-old daughter. And so we went back to him and we asked him to backtrack his trail because there's credible evidence that the two girls might be together. And so um, we and we also reached out to whatever resources we, we could, but we were frustrated. We, we knew we were kind of on our own. There were some good resources like the, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, the Poly Class Foundation, some uh, resources in California, but ultimately it was up to us to find her. Uh, and so uh, at about three weeks in, we were getting increasingly frustrated. It was like a needle in a haystack. We got leads that she could be, those two girls, both girls we're trying to find, could be in Los Angeles, Riverside, San Bernardino, San Diego County, even Mexico. And that's 15 or so million people. And so, as I mentioned, it's, it's like a, a needle in a haystack. So um, after that, a little while later, uh, we connected with a San Diego-based uh, nonprofit, Saved in America. And they were a godsend because all of a sudden they told us they could bring us resources that the police could not. The police had sort of tagged her as a runaway, even though they were 15 and 16 years old, and never, never worked, and didn't have driver's licenses. But nonetheless, based on their age, they tagged him as missing uh, or runaway potentially. And so even though my daughter never had a history of running away or delinquency, and, and, and even knowing that she was with a girl that had been caught up in sex trafficking previously and was in serious danger. Uh, so what um, Saved in America did is they brought cyber, legal, uh, all kinds of resources to supplement what the police departments were doing 
and eventually, and social media, and through social media, Facebook actually, we, um, in a tip line and, and a reward, we were able to get a Good Samaritan to give us a tip. Uh, and then Saved in America in conjunction with LA County Sheriff's was actually able to rescue the two girls in Compton. But that's, so we got the girls back, but that's not the end of the story. The girls couldn't go home. There was, there was safety issues and um, they needed treatment and finding treatment resources for what these girls, these two traumatized young teens was difficult. They eventually were sent to treatment centers in different states, Utah and in Nevada. Um, and they were there for a year and a half. So you got your daughter back, but then she has to go away. And so that was hard. So through that ordeal, um, which leads to the conversations that others are going to have today, I think that there's a significant need for more federal, uh, state, and local resources to train and educate police departments to provide education for children and their parents and communities and schools. Um, and uh, to increase support for the victims of the, uh, as I mentioned, uh, as well as bringing justice to the perpetrators and the predators um, of these vulnerable. And one last comment about vulnerable. Um, I, there are certain types of, of young people and children that are most vulnerable, in my opinion, foster kids, emancipated foster kids, those with mental health issues, those from poor, poor communities, I've heard girls from poor communities say, uh, oh, girls go missing all the time. It just not, doesn't not get an attention in, in the inner cities and urban areas. We don't know where they are. And there's less resources than there would be, say, in our upper middle class suburban area where, um, where we lived. And even that was hard for us, but it's particularly hard for some of these really vulnerable populations. So attention needs to be given in particular to them. So thank you for being given the time today to speak to you. No, and thank you, Maureen. It's, it's very heartbreaking very to hear that, as well as know fully well that this happened in your background, back, backyard, let's put it that way. So, you know, you just nailed it, that you're in a middle-class neighborhood who a lot of parents think our kids are protected. And not really, let me put it that way. So, Adam, right. I mean, listening to Maureen talk about her story and you being the attorney general at one point, dedicating your time about this. What's your perspective on the communication of these issues, especially how law, law enforcement is actually handling all this? I mean, like, what's your background? Like, what do you feel is such something that we need to look out and be aware of and talk, talk to people about? Adam, I, I'm sorry, Adam, you're muted. <laughs> Perfect. Sorry Thank about you. that. Um, so first, I'd like to get across to everybody today that Maureen's story is absolutely not a unique story. And as this poll showed, half the people don't think it's going on in their neighborhood. I can assure you it is going on in your neighborhood. I can assure you we heard stories of, as Maureen was saying, all socioeconomic classes being affected by this. Uh, and it does hit suburbia. And um, as, as Maureen's story, I, I think, uh, exhibits very clearly. So this is serious. It needs to be taken seriously. The problem is that I think historically when a 16-year-old girl disappears, there's been the mindset that that was by choice and that it is either a runaway or they're just out using drugs and that if they end up joining that life, uh, that that it is something that in the end of the day was a was something that girl and and sometimes guy uh, chose and so I, I think it was dealt differently from a law enforcement perspective and frankly from a community perspective and so what we've seen is a sea change in an understanding that in the end of the day um, these these poor girls ages as young as eight to up, up to 18 and, and, and on into adulthood um, for a variety of reasons uh, that we don't have time to get in today. Uh, so many things have happened in their lives that, that they do become taken advantage of. And then once a, a human trafficker is in possession, oftentimes under very kind and sincere, sweet terms, uh, then they end up in prison. Um, in, in the type of pr prison that we heard described so often, and uh, I, I can assure the, the parents on this call that 
you heard one of these stories, you would understand uh, that, that no girl actually chooses this life. And so I think that was a very first, very important shift in transition. And so in, in the state of Nevada, until just these past few years, it wasn't actually a crime. There was no crime of human trafficking. So that was a big priority to make sure this was a serious felony offense where people could go to jail for 20 years or more if they were captured for doing this type of horrific offense. And so I know in our office, we had the first human trafficking conviction in the history of the state of Nevada in 2015 or 16. And so that may be hard for your listeners to say, how, how can that be? You know, you, someone is stealing another human being. They're selling their body, torturing them, beating them, drugging them. How did people like this not get charged with criminal offenses? And so that's a big shift that, that if you don't have that in your state, you need to find a champion legislator or hopefully an attorney general that is willing to make that you know, criminal justice sea change. Um, the other thing that we did was historically, if you were a victim of human trafficking, you weren't viewed as a victim and or a survivor and so you likely maybe you were in and off in and off the streets a few times and you had been arrested and and so you can never get back on with your life and so we created expungement statutes and indeed we tried to educate law enforcement that we probably shouldn't be arresting the girl in the first place um, and they should never have a criminal offense. So those are some of the macro things that, that I suggest you start to talk to your elected representatives uh, about. Uh, and I recognize some of you are in big states. Maybe you don't ever get to talk to your representatives, but uh, this group can help. Um, and, and you just have to take no for an answer to make sure that you, you press this agenda. And last, I'll leave with that we created a statewide law enforcement tool that allowed anyone could go on and find every single nonprofit provider, every single uh, law enforcement entity, the number to call. And in fact, we eventually created an app as well. And so uh, not every state has that kind of thing, but, but it is important that people understand how to get in the system, how to get help from the system. As Maureen's story told, told everyone, uh, once you're into this nightmare, it's very hard to figure out how to get your way out. And that's why some of these nonprofits like Saved in America, that, that, you know, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need Saved in America. But the bottom line is law enforcement is overstrapped with a lot of different mandates. And so uh, to dedicate a team of resources to go after a single girl just, you know, plenty of law enforcement entities do not have those resources. And so thankfully, Saved in America and other nonprofits across the country are trying to fill that void. Thank you, Adam. And actually, you brought some interesting points that I actually may come back to you if there's time to ask you about later on. Um, but before we turn to Stephanie, because I want Stephanie to talk about the dangers and being such a big advocate for Saved in America and being on the board and all this other that great stuff that you've been doing. Um, let me turn to the audience before we go to you, though, and here's why. Um, Kim, can we do the second question? Are you having conversations with your loved ones about the danger of trafficking? And the reason we're posting this, and this is going to segue right into Stephanie, is Stephanie has seen so much that happens that I think she can talk about the dangers um, that's out there that we're not even aware of as parents. I myself, again, had an experience um, that I'm, like, I'm happy to share later on. But now's not the right time. Um, so we'd love to hear if anyone has actually talked to their loved ones about the dangers of trafficking. Thankfully, yes, uh -huh. that's a lot more than actually knowing the trafficking right. background. Stephanie, that's I'm going to turn to you. You know, you, you, you've done so much. Um, can you shed some light on the efforts that's made, the technologies, the legislation that's out there, the social media aspects that we talked about briefly, the dangers that's out there that um, people don't realize about? Please. Absolutely. I'll, I'll shed some light on some facts and what's really going on. Uh, of course, due to the coronavirus, the coronavirus crimes are on a rise. Children, our children, are online, as Senator Jones said earlier, more than ever. 70% of sex trafficking victims are sold online. 
which means a child with a computer, a laptop, a smartphone, gaming, they are all at risk with connecting with a potential predator online. Uh, one in five kids have been sexually solicited online. This is disturbing too. One in seven children with a smartphone have received a text sex by the age of 10. So we need to ensure now more than ever that we raise awareness on the predators, the gang members, the traffickers who are out there preying on our children. People can say, oh, this is not happening in my neighborhood. It's not demographic specific. For example, in San Diego County alone, there has been an identified gang member, trafficker, or recruiter at every middle school and high school in all of San Diego County. They are out there. They're in full force. They are catfishing everyone. For example, Snapchat, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, even dating apps. There's no, they'll, they'll catfish women. Uh, the oldest person that I've known that has been trafficked is 60 years old. So we need to be cognizant of what our children are doing. As many of the parents are busy working at home, we also need to be cognizant of what is going on while our families are working. Please pay attention to all those applications on your children's phones. It is vital these traffickers are preying on our kids more than ever. Thankfully for, for Senator Jones and Adam and our presidential administration, we are focusing on combating this huge issue. Uh, for example, back in April of 2018, the Senate and the House, they passed an act, uh, Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act, and the House's Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. Together they became a law that made it illegal that if you are hosting or if there are illegal online services and you're knowingly assisting and facilitating and supporting sex traffickers on your platform, we can come after you. We can come after you. Unfortunately, those two acts that are now a law do not go after the traffickers. However, January 31st of this year, President Trump signed an executive order to combat trafficking and online child exploitation. Many of us have heard President Trump has stated time and time again, human trafficking is a form of modern slavery. With that said, this is happening across the nation. The reason why it's important that that executive order was signed because it allows us to work with all the different states, the local law enforcement, all the attorney generals, Congress, Senate, most importantly, President Trump's executive order is strengthening the federal responsiveness to human trafficking. He's working closely with the Secretary of State, Homeland Security, and HUD. Even Ben Carson is helping us as well to ensure that, like Maureen said earlier, once you retrieve a child, we have to make sure they get the treatment and the housing that is available to them to ensure that they can go back into the community and feel safe. So together with technology and our legislation, as a country, as a nation, we are combating this horrific issue. Thank, thank you, Stephanie. And you know, I, I, like I shared with you, I had gotten to fight with a manufacturer because of a software problem. Um, and before I go to Maureen, a little briefly, um, I have two young kids and that being said, you, there's so many holes in these, I would say, protection of young children and minors from these software companies that you, your parents aren't aware of. And I'm going to go to Maureen then. Can you share your views on the technology that's potentially overlooked that these predators are utilizing in order to prey on your kids? Um, and, you know, you, you being there already, I, I think this can resonate a lot more to parents that's out there. Yes, based on my experience, I think you have to understand that children uh, do, do not have a lot of privacy. You have to watch what they're doing. You have to protect them. You're responsible for them. And so you really, as much as you can, and it is challenging, you need to track what they're doing on social media. Because most, as, as you've described, Stephanie, you mentioned, um, it, 
it's going to come to them not necessarily through someone that uh, is a stranger to them, or it may be an intermediary. In the case of my daughter, she was being cultivated by this 15-year-old girl that had already been trafficked, and she was bringing her in and, you know, and said, hey, come, come meet me and my boyfriend. The boyfriend was a, a man in his late 40s who was a sex trafficker. But, you know, so you have to be really careful. So you have to be able to watch what kind of communications are going on with your children and take their phones sometimes, to look at their computer, um, you know, really be aware of what they're doing. And it is difficult, but, um, but I think that as a parent, you have to just uh, not put a premium on privacy of your child because they don't know. Sometimes they're naive. They're more naive than we are. <laughs> about what's out there and more susceptible is your daughter receptive to that right now i'm just kind of curious um especially yeah she's she, go ahead so now that you you've gone through it she's done you know treatment etc is she more receptive to you being part of it and helping her through this but now she's 21 so okay. that was um but no, a few years ago. She's, yeah i'm sorry she's uh yeah she's just about to turn 21. Wow. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so she, but, you know, it's changed her outlook on life uh, and just she's very cautious about people and, and things because you're still vulnerable at 21 years old. Um, you know, a lot of young adults are, are vulnerable to this as well. Yeah, well, Stephanie just made a statement that the oldest trafficking victim is 60 years old, so it's scary out there. Um, Adam, yeah. coming to you, just thinking about all this, you know, I've gotten a few fake profiles. I will say that I'm a professional professional LinkedIn profile. Um, Stephanie, you probably got a lot as well, and Maureen, I'm sure if you're you're on, you see fake profiles trying to, I would say, catfish yep. women, um, and it's not just young children. What do you, what's your recommendations? And it's not just for parents with children, and it's also the adults who's out there with this technology that's out there that really, I don't think it's being regulated as much that, as it should be. For, for myself and uh, protecting our children, it's exactly what Maureen said, you know, we need to ensure we know what our children are doing on their phones. We should know every app that's on their phone. We should have access to all their passwords. We should have parental guidelines. Uh, there are ways you can do that on some of the phones. It's essential to know the passwords to every email, text, uh, social media. Social media. Uh, again, these uh, predators don't care. They're going to find any way to lure you away from home. The other thing that's really, really important is to establish trust and open communication with your children. Speak honestly and openly. Let them know there are people out there that are going to try to lure you away. And as Maureen mentioned earlier as well, most of the people that are lured, boys and girls, it's not always just girls being trafficked, are being lured by somebody that they are an acquaintance of. Uh, most of them uh, meet that. 20% of the high schoolers have met somebody blank on the yeah. internet. No, most of the time, it's somebody they know. But I would have a GPS. I mean, look at technology today. We can track our phones. We can track everybody with all the different apps out there. Uh, if you have a child under 18, most definitely, you're paying the bill, most likely, on their technology. You might as well have access to all that as well. Because what happens is, when a child appears to be missing, more than likely, they have been lured from their home via a predator, via one of those apps. Adam, you're muted. So I don't know if you wanted to chime in on that real quickly. Yeah, I would just say that um, I was raised by a single mom. And she was a child of the 60s. And for the most part, I had no rules. And, and she, she believed very much that I'd go figure it out and kind of grow up along the way. And uh, I, I won't uh, go down that road with this group. But suffice to say, I got in plenty of trouble. Um, and and I'm, I'm fortunate I made it through, um, through, through high school. But I, I just have to say that, that that mindset just can't hold in 2020. There is so many dangerous things out there, and it was there's already enough dangerous things just in a community and in a neighborhood 
but when you add the social media component, you just can't fathom what is going on out there, how much terrible stuff is going on out there, and, and how many people are preying on especially young girls. And so, um, yeah, I, I mean, fortunately or unfortunately for my, my seven and four-year-old daughters, um, they do not have phones yet. I don't know how long we're going to hold the line. We're going to try to hold it till we're 18, maybe. Um, <laughs> but, but it is, it's just, it's really, really rough out there. And it's not the situation where they just got to go out and learn and grow up. They're, they're just, there's just, when you have these criminal organized gangs that have run out of certain ways to make money, they realized some years ago you can only sell a drug one time and you can sell a girl many times and that's a horrible image for me to leave with this call but it's an important one they want to to kidnap girls because they know they can make unlimited money off of a a sex slave um and so that can yeah. be any one of our daughters and so it is I, i'm sorry <laughs> to be so ominous uh but but this topic deserves that kind of tone because boom, you could be Maureen and you could just wake up yep. and, and you just can't believe it. But your 16 year old daughter got lured away by some guy, maybe he's, seems really nice online is offering, you know, to a nice car and some jewelry and a, and a few good dinners. And, and we think we're doing a great job <laughs> raising our kids, but we can't prevent this type of activity. And it, it's good that you say that. Um, it's kind of rea reality mm -hmm. check and a wake-up call. A really good question came in from an audience member, Robert Aponte. When it relates to human trafficking, do you have any data that reflects that many large-scale sporting events, such as Super Bowls and high-profile horse races, are known locations where human trafficking occurs without the knowledge of the common attendees? And I think this is a this may be a common quick, you know, question for all three of you. So maybe I'll start with Adam first. If you can unmute. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell me, are my headphones causing background? Can everyone hear no, me okay? I'm okay. Right now? I can hear you. Okay. So so I, I do have a directly on point update on this. My, my former chief of staff is now the U.S. attorney for the state of Nevada. So for those who don't know, every state has a federal prosecutor that's in, 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 in charge of all federal prosecutions. And so he had created a task force with the NFL for Las Vegas when we were going to have the draft. So that's going to be a large scale event and, and bring people in. And he had done that because of what what the caller uh, had, had alluded to, the fact that large scale events do bring a lot of predatory behavior. Um, the only thing I can say on the positive note is that law enforcement knows this, and understands this, and certainly in the case of Super Bowls and these big events, I'd be shocked if every event going forward doesn't have this kind of large-scale law enforcement presence and people are scanning everything both online and in the physical side of these venues to try to look out for it. And there's always warnings and ways that people that are going that they should be looking out for, ways they can report things. And so you've heard it in other contexts, see something, say something. Um, and in this case, you should, and most always, you should follow that advice. But in this case in particular, you should follow that kind of advice. All right, Stephanie, do you, I mean, do you, do you have thoughts on yeah. that, especially on that end? Of, of course. So where we live in San Diego, uh, we have conventions all the time in downtown San Diego. You will see a lot of, uh, let's call it like sex slavery going on, believe it or not, Humane Hub in San Diego near the convention center and hotel circle where a lot of the attendees stay. So they are out there. They're at baseball games. They're at major Super Bowls. They're everywhere. Uh, for where I live, personally, it's always Hotel Circle downtown. Cause there's, well, pre-COVID, there was a convention going on weekly. And I have heard of people telling me that some of the hotels will even have menus of girls so they can handpick which girls they would like for the evening. Wow, that's um, very scary as a parent. Um, 
I, you know, I, I, I'm going to go to the third question really quickly because I think this kind of segues into the third question. Kim, if you don't mind bringing up the third question really quick, are, is, does our audience realize that there's local agencies in your neighborhood that's dedicated to combating human trafficking? And I think this is kind of this is relevant because I think to to Adam's point and Stephanie's point and also Maureen is that knowing who they are is going to be helpful if you do become a victim of trafficking. Um, and and with that, we also had another question that came in for and I think Maureen, this is more geared for you, for from Vicky Chavez. Studies have shown that survivors of human trafficking are hyper vigilant with their own children is your program in saved by america that caters to survivors who are now parents and you being a parent and now a huge advocate um i think this is a great um maybe this is something you respond to and looking at this it's again close to 50 50. um folks out there aren't really concentrated on and maybe adam you can respond to that later on is how do we get more involved so if maureen if you don't mind answering the question first yeah, so um, people that have children and adults that have been sexually abused or, or, or victimized, traumatized like this, they have post-traumatic stress. And so uh, whether they're a parent or not, they need ongoing treatment. And that is one of the, the areas where it's very important, the immediate and then probably, you know, lifelong. Um, and that's a good point that Vicki brings up about, um, you know, once they become a parent, how are they going to react? And I don't know, there's probably studies on that. Obviously, parents that have experienced post-traumatic stress, um, you know, that, that may affect their parenting. Um, I, Saved in America is focused on, you know, treatment, initial treatment and ongoing treatment programs. Um, and that is kind of legislatively, and it sounds like um, in Nevada and other places, they've worked on that. I know Nevada is, has, has, has some of these treatment facilities, but, um, but I think in general, you just have to realize that they're, they've experienced post-traumatic stress and it's gonna affect the rest of their lives. In fact, I, I talk about my daughter, there was a daughter before this event and there's a daughter after and, and they're different. She came, she came back a different person. Yeah, wow, uh, and that's very sad to hear, um, really, especially when you have to go through all this and live with this for the rest of your life. Adam, yeah. I'm gonna to come to you really quickly what kind of recommendations you have to bring awareness to this? So that way, at least if we can prevent someone from going into, you know, <laughs> becoming a victim of this. You're muted. <laughs> Sorry, Adam, you got to mute. I'm a rookie on this thing. <laughs> okay. I've been doing Zoom, so I'm, I'm not used to this one. Um, okay, so I, I recognize not everyone can take this on um but but one of the most successful things that we did was creating and amplifying a survivor benefit dinner and at least over the years that i was attorney general i think we had 150 people or so at the first dinner and then we ended near a thousand people um and so this is twofold uh it was a fundraiser and the fundraiser the the funds nevada created something uni unique where there was a human trafficking fund that was that you could contribute into and it was it could be distributed in under 24 hours to any nonprofit that applied and so that may be too complicated for some states uh but i throw that out there that it worked for us and it was a good concept but regardless the funds that you raise for a dinner you can partner with a nonprofit or create a nonprofit and and the point is that when a girl is when she is kidnapped and taken into this other life the getting the girl back is only the first step then how do you keep the girl out of being pulled back into the life um, obviously if, if if it was a terrifying experience that that, that particular victim uh, you know doesn't really want to be in that community and so we would immediately fund a girl to fly to say idaho and she'd be put up in a hotel for 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 two weeks three weeks meanwhile a nonprofit would start working with her to either get her treatment as maureen suggested or to get her a job or to find a new place for her to live and and, and fortunately start her life over but 
it almost always takes that. And so I would focus on some sort of dinner that can help create this quick reaction funding uh, mm -hmm. because that's so key to give a girl a chance. Uh, it's, it's sort of like uh, alcoholism when you're trying to recover from alcoholism. I mean, the, the odds of going to treatment and then being cured are, are virtually zero. Um, you need all of this stuff on the back end to give you a great shot. And, and I would think about it similarly for those that those of you that have been touched with, with alcoholism or, or drug abuse. So um, the other piece of this dinner was awareness. You know, we have 300 people on this, this call now, and, and you all will be touched in some way by this and go talk to others. We had these thousand person events, always a just really gut-wrenching personal story from a survivor typically and all I ever heard afterward was, I can't believe this goes on in Reno. I can't believe this happens in Las Vegas. None of us think this happens in our community. And we would always pull a, pull a survivor from our state. And so it had a huge impact. And then people would, would, would continue to get the word out. And people would, X percent of the people would make this their passion. And they say, I want to volunteer now. Where can I volunteer? And so it all kind of snowballs in, in, in the right way in this situation for, for a very important cause. Yeah, that's, that's good. Stephanie, you know, looking at you, what do you think? How can we proactively, you know, support this kind of cause, especially protecting our children? You know, I'm a mother. I know plenty of mothers out there that aren't even aware of half what I do. But what, what can we do? Well, again, have a great, open, honest communication with your children. Uh, you know, educate them what's going on out there. Uh, it's key to be able to be able to have open and honest communication. Uh, we got to make sure we're not on the eve, but also it all starts at home. We have to ensure we are aware this is going on in our neighborhood. I'm sure it's going on in my community. Does down the street? You just don't know. The other thing that I would suggest you do too is. You can check to see what online sexual predators or, I'm sorry, sex offenders that are living near or around your community. That's very, very helpful. The other thing, too, and my parents did this when I was little to help me stay out of trouble, keep your children busy. Put them in activities. Have them busy, whether, well, now it's a little different with COVID, but, you know, have them busy. Have them act, doing activities. Go throw a baseball with your son outside. You know, teach your daughter, you know, other life lessons that I didn't learn it, how to cook. You know, engage your children um, and keep them busy with activities, music, sports, watching movies, church youth groups. You know, keep them involved and keep them busy so that, unfortunately, this does not happen to them because our statistics are just growing. Uh, in San Diego County alone, sex trafficking generates $810 million a year. Uh, so this is growing, it's not going to get better. Uh, I did see some questions coming in. Well, yes. how do we counteract what's happening? So I'm looking at the chat line too. <laughs> one of the key things that I brought up earlier, one of the things that happens to a trafficker, the laws aren't strict enough. By the way, these traffickers are smart, like in Maureen's situation. They're having other girls do the luring so that they themselves don't get arrested. It's a minor. The laws are not strict enough. In some states, it's simply a slap in the hand and misdemeanor. That is exactly why President Trump signed this executive order. We've got to get together as a federal government across all states, working with all state attorney generals. Uh, for example, Attorney General Sean Reyes, great guy, really into this. We all have to collaborate and work together because right now, those laws are not strict at all for the trafficker. And, and, you know, I'm looking at the time, so we have 10 minutes left. I'm going to take some questions, and you just made a really, really good point, because I think Adam touched on it. And I'm going to make you turn off your mic, your mic so you can speak to this, Adam. You talked about the first criminal being charged in 2015, 2016, the mindset there. Can you talk a little about the mindset? Because I think we can, can kind of segue into this question that came in, which is, on the flip side, what are we, what's being done about the consumer of the trafficking to curtail the demand for the victims 
because this mindset has to change somewhat. And I think if you can answer that part about the law enforcement and a segue into that question, hopefully that helps, helps understand psychologically why that's the case. Well, I just think more people need to dial into this issue. And um, I think presumably we have nearly 100% um, agreement on this call now or this, this webinar. Um, that this is a serious crime and a human trafficker should face felony offenses and should go behind bars as long as we can, uh, as long as they possibly can. And so for whatever reason, historically, like I said, uh, I think because people viewed there was a choice component in this um, and that people were exchanging money and, um, you know, it was basically commerce. Um, that it just wasn't viewed as the serious criminal activity that it is. And so um, I think it's unavoidable now. Um, this used to be smaller scale. And, and now the fact that it entails these large criminal syndicates. And, you know, I think maybe your callers have heard of MS-13 now. Um, you know, this is a serious criminal syndicate. And one of the things they do is traffic women. It's, it's an it's a income-generating uh, thing to keep their enterprise going. And so I think for the most part, we've gotten over that hurdle. And, and most people, if asked that question, so someone go to jail for trafficking a girl? Uh, I, I, th I think the clear answer is yes. Um, but there will be people, and you need to be patient with them, that say, did that girl choose that life? And if so, and did, and, and did she sell herself, and she made money, and she got to buy a nice coat, and she got to drive a nice car, and, you know, is that really a, a criminal thing? Um, and, and we need to emphasize that just try to think about your daughter and whether or not she could have been lured away at 14 or 15 um, and, and you, you just lost her. And once she started the train of drugs and the manipulation and the control uh, and the fear, uh, then, then that girl really isn't free to go in the way I think that, that maybe X percentage of the public believe that woman can go. Any day, any day she wants, she could pick up, walk right out that door. So why does this concern us? Um, and that's what we focused on on our why we always had survivors speak. They would go into grave detail of the amount of manipulation that happened and the coercion and the fear and oftentimes straight up violence. They will yeah. beat the women. They will they will absolutely violently intimidate them. If you leave, if you tell anyone, I will kill you. That that that, that, that is really happening every single day. Mm -hmm. and, and yep. I think this is for Marie. Now that your daughter is home, she's added obviously an adult now. You you mentioned that getting her treatment to help this. And you said she couldn't be with you because of the dangers. Can you talk, you know, just based off of what Adam said, can you talk briefly about this, um, about that a little bit so our audience can understand? Yeah, sure. So both, there were two girls, uh, 15 and a 16 year old. One of them was in a much more serious uh, situation than my daughter because she had um, been, you know, trafficked before and had d disappeared from a, 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 a treatment center in, in LA. So she had to go to a lockdown facility in Nevada, um, but she had more intensive treatment. Uh, but my daughter needed immediately within a, within a week or so to get out of there. We had to get them out of the, wh where the, they could find these girls. And so she went to Utah. The issue in terms of, uh, you know, dealing with Saved in America, we were trying to find places quickly for them. And uh, these treat residential treatment centers are like 10,000 a month. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, there was some resources that we were able to find and, it, you know, but you have to be fairly savvy to find that. Most people aren't going to be able to pay for 10,000 a month. Yeah. And so uh, uh, luckily we end up not having to pay that and nor the other girl uh, parents. But um, it, it, they're, they're very few uh, places and they're very expensive. And so, you know, whether there can be fit more federal or state level resources uh, subsidizing, you know, nonprofits, what have you, um, as opposed to them having to go for these like, you know, private ones. There's a lot of private ones that charge a lot of money. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that, is a, that is a really big issue because there'll be recidivism. You know, they'll go back, you know, if they're, if, if they're not treated and they're not protected and, and kept uh, hidden from um, those that could um, perpetrate, you know, these crimes against them again. Wow, that's crazy. Um, we're yeah. going to do one final question um, before we end. Um, Stephanie, I think this is the best question for you. Um, yeah. Do you have any data of the percentage of kids and teenagers that are caught through social media? Of course. So on a daily basis, every, every single day, uh, 300,000 missing children occur every day. 300,000 children are missing every day in our country. 30% of those missing are being trafficked. So as I earlier had brought up, 70% of human trafficking uh, victims are sold online. So back to, so that's a lot of statistics there, but 20% out of this total of high schoolers have met someone in person the first time from somebody they met on the internet. And they are being lured. So yes, those statistics are very sketchy and sad because this is what they're doing to our children. Um, I always like to say facts. I can tell you percentages and facts all day long. Those are very telling. Uh, they do not have the best interest at hand. But yes, 20% of those high schoolers for the first time have met somebody in person from whom they met online. Almost school, but probably that is so crazy. Um, and unfortunately, we're out of time, so I'm just looking at the clock really, really quickly. Uh, and thank you, thank you, panel members, for being here. Um, and, you know, Maureen, thank you for actually being so brave and actually speaking about your personal experience, because I, it takes a lot for someone to actually speak up about that kind of experience, because I know a lot of people have been through stuff, and they're ashamed. So, you know, thank you so much thank for you. that. It, it is hard to talk publicly about it. Yeah, yeah thank you. I, I'm sure. But before we want, we end the webinar. No, sorry, Stephanie, do you want to say something before we close it? Of course. So for everyone out there, we are a nation, nationwide national organization. Uh, we have more information on savedinamerica.org. However, if you need our assistance, and if we haven't hit on it earlier, our organization is built up by active retired law enforcement, special operators, and Navy SEALs. Who better to have help go covert utilizing our active military here in San Diego? Uh, we do have a tip line. So if you need to reach out to us, you can call us at 760-348-8808. You can go online at our website that you see there uh, if you want to fill out an application. But if you have questions, you can send us an email at info at savedinamerica.org. We are here. We also have foundations that actually help push some of the girls uh, forward in their educational uh, services on those that have been trafficked. So we don't just end at retrieval. We go above and beyond to help all of our children. No, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Maureen. And thank you, Adam. So before we end the webinar, thank you, everybody, for coming. We wanted to take the time to mention that there are many professional organizations out there that help educate, train, and inform, and communicate about human trafficking. So if folks locally don't know, definitely reach out to Saved in America. Um, but there's also local, your local law enforcement, also the attorney general, um, as Adam stated, reach out to folks because we really do need that support in order to bring, you know, eradicate. Okay. So with that note, um, we are officially over, um, but please keep an eye out for a second part. We will be talking about technology, I think, in a little more details with technology, Stephanie, right? Um, so keep an eye out for that and save the date. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time. Thank being you. Here. Hope everybody takes something away with them. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.